Um, Tammy Brister is our next speaker. Um, she works at Automatic as an uh, experienced designer for the WordPress.org project. Uh, she does that for full time. She's currently the design lead for phase one of Gutenberg, which is the new WordPress visual editor that is in a lot of talking points at the moment. Um, and uh, she will be uh, talking about how Gutenberg has been designed. Um, so let's start. Uh, Gutenberg Design Matters, creating open source by Amelista. Can you hear me with this microphone as well? Is this on? Just turn the microphone on? Yeah. Oh. Uh, so, I said uh, Gutenberg is the new content creating and editing experience. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the foundations of Gutenberg and also about what it's like designing in open source. And Gutenberg is going to be shipped in version 5.0 of WordPress. But why is this being created? Well, making rich content should be easier than it is today. How many of you have seen Snowfall? So this was a story that appeared a few years ago and showed that this is the type of content that is expected by everyone. We expect to be able to create this rich content wherever we are. We want to be able to post photos on the move, write blog posts during a train ride. We expect to read and be engaged, to not just have a wall of text. If we just want text, then we're going to save that to an offline service. The web has become an entertainment platform and not just one that delivers content. Without a change, the future of WordPress is uncertain and we will have to face that. Today we aren't, as a project, the only or even easiest choice often for people to make. And whilst right now that kind of that phrase feels a little bit bleak, as a project, that's a good thing because that is where uh, these changes like Gutenberg come in. And in itself, Gutenberg isn't going to save WordPress. It's not a super heroin or a miracle cure. It is a start. It's a step in the right direction in making, shifting WordPress into the future and into relevance. So this is Gutenberg. And Gutenberg has three phases. I'm going to take a little bit of a look at each of these in this introduction. The editor, which is the phase we're in at the moment, is the first phase. And whilst this is focusing on editing, the groundwork has been set for the next phases in the first. And this is the reason it's taking a little bit longer than others are going to take after. The next phase is customization. And this is where those more, what you would say, page builder aspects are going to be happening. And rather than a hard stop in between phases, this next one will transition and potentially overlap the phase one. And likely this is going to be starting by looking at templating, and that's one area of WordPress that is powerful, but actually very problematic for most people to function with. And the last is that of theme. And this is going to involve that work in the past two phases being built on and potentially what that does is not known yet. And it's going to be a really exciting time to follow through these three phases. So Gutenberg has been designed in the open. And there are lots and lots of different places where feedback has happened. And that has influenced and changed the design direction of Gutenberg. You can just see how many different types of sources of feedback have been given to Gutenberg. And Gutenberg is actually created, iterated, and then released more or less 
in a weekly or bi-weekly rotation. And as the version numbers have added up, issues have been made, discussions happened on GitHub, and throughout the project. And this is truly a project made in the community. It's created in public, also on the core editor channel. But what about the design foundations of Google Work? Before I dive into a kind of a deeper look into some specific design decisions, I'm going to share with you some of the foundation patterns of the new editor experience. So it all starts with the block. This is the foundation. And what does a block look like? Well, this is a block. You can set the position of the toolbar and you can combine blocks to get that rich content that I showed you before. And blocks allow for quick understanding. Once you understand how they you know, interact and you understand the block, you understand how to use all blocks. And they allow for this drop-in functionality beyond the core blocks as well. So you can maybe get a plug-in with certain types of blocks as well and just have them work. The potential is really only just being touched on what actually can be done with these. And blocks actually have an advantage, and one of those big ones is isolating errors. So block by block, HTML editing or errors serve as a barrier over breaking the entire post. So if there is something wrong with that block or some error, then it will only mean that that block is flagged and, and you have to fix that. The block is a boundary, a safe container for your content. Placeholders are also a foundation pattern. They indicate what a block is going to contain and a few different states along the way. Each state guides you through that interaction. For example, in this case, an image block. And placeholders also change based on interactions. Here you see an image block in various different states as someone interacts with it. You can resize right there and then, and you can also add a caption. In a template, for example, you could take advantage of this. Imagine a template uploading, showing just a page full of placeholders like this. This is a lot better than an empty, large input box, right? Nobody knows what to do with a box that just says content here doesn't actually say what type of content. It's not an indication of what the template will look like on the front and, quite honestly, a confusing experience for someone using it. Placeholders really progress towards a more what you see is what you get type of experience. So our brains actually don't handle everything all on the same level. We need to have options filtered. And Gutenberg, at its core, exposes all the options you need when you need them, nothing more. But our brains also won't, <laughs> kind of, they don't work with having everything surface because they freeze. And we, if we have to search endlessly for something, we grow impatient and we just have a break with that experience. Frustration leads to us really not having trust with what we're interacting with. And nobody is going to want to use something that destroys that. Being able to have just what you want when you need it without having to hunt for options or really being overwhelmed is something Gutenberg is trying to achieve. And that's needs-based options. There are a few ways that this happens. The biggest one is through primary and secondary actions for blocks. Primary actions appear right beside the block. They are the must-haves. The things a block simply cannot function without for the majority of people. The expected options. Those are right where people need them, and there aren't so many to overwhelm, as you can see here with the power. Just enough, nothing more. Secondary actions are in the sidebar, and these are reached by another key interaction element, which is the more menu. 
And this uses the ellipsis icon that is commonly used in a lot of other experiences. Here you have extras, things it's okay to discover as they aren't essential to the usage of the block. For example, as you can see here, styling options. By following a needs-based approach to options, the person actually creating the content feels more in control and by having those secondary actions, exploration can happen as well. <coughs> Allowing for safe exploration is a key to interaction delight. And those little extra options, that secondary step, also makes sense. Someone discovers it and they feel an achievement. Another pattern is transformations. And that's of changing a block to another block. So why is this so important? Well, it's a way to change your mind about content. For example, maybe you just write paragraphs down the page and you're just writing and you're in the flow. And then you want to change that content and add some style and change to different blocks. Well, you can do that with transformations. And this all actually bolsters, uh, bolsters the actual flow of writing. Now it's not a pattern specifically, the different modes of Gutenberg are worth calling out as a recent feature because they're crucial to really giving that choice in how people interact. The first of these is Spotlight. Here you can focus on the actual content that's being interacted with and this is a step towards a kind of distraction-free experience that a lot of editing has. And talking about distraction free, here you can see this mode takes it to full screen. This is still within WordPress. We've just, it's a layer that appears. And it even removes that WordPress wrapper so you don't have the sidebar. And you can focus on the actual content, nothing more. And that's great when you're writing. And where you have the toolbar is also up to you. You can position beside the block or you can have it in the top. It's really up to you for your writing style. And what about combining it all? I actually really like this as a writing experience. So those are some of the foundations in Gutenberg. But I'd like to share some actual examples of features that got made and designed in the open. And I'm going to dive into those. But before I do that, I wanted to share where you can find some of these design discussions happening if you wanted to participate and really discover them. If you're looking to get involved in Gutenberg from a design perspective, you can follow two labels specifically. They are the design feedback label. And here you can see the GitHub account. And also needs design. This is a great way of needs design to say, hey, something actually needs work on. And the design feedback is great to just jump in and be able to participate and give insight. And what I'm going to share now is a kind of issues that have happened in these formats. So block variants, now style variants, depending on who you speak to, is one feature that got designed by the community. And most designs happen like this in Gutenberg. Someone suggests something, then iteration begins and initiate. In this case, it's a proposal to add different styles for blocks, for example, quotes. So Chris came along and he suggested a different interface and gave comments on the previous one. And the discussion flows. A common practice is to see like here when someone suggests something in response to another mock. Uh, you can see this evolution of the interface happening where designers are passing designs to and fro each other. And here we get to the final point of the interface as it slowly morphed. We have this one and then we have this, the final iteration, which you will more or less recognize. It's worth noting that changes also happen after development or during development of pull requests. And a pull request is a, the name for what GitHub uses, which something has worked in code. And that occurs between developers and designers commenting in those pull requests. 
then feedback also goes beyond that, and then iteration beyond that as well. Once a feature is released, iteration really is at the heart of Google because it's at the heart of WordPress. So material icons were added a little while ago, and this met the need of not having that many icons already in the set because having a larger set means that those making blocks can then have a wider choice. And beyond that, it also scales beautifully and easily across all devices. So Riyadh actually came up with suggestions in this pull request. And this then was iterated. So from the original idea, it then, in the pull request, was iterated. A developer had some ideas, and these were worked through. And just like WordPress core, Gutenberg has this strong collaboration across roles. And here, the iterations suggested are added, and then the discussion happens. And just like anything in track, GitHub allows you to follow and dive into it historically. You can see all these examples I am sharing here and really discover for yourself the process and decisions. And after some discussion, you can see it goes off a little bit, you know, and then dove into some iterations. And then finally, we have Merge. This is where the feature was shipped and released in the next version. So that's kind of a good insight into the life cycle of how something happens in design for Gutenberg. And it's worth sharing one final thing of, in this section on commenting. As whilst this isn't a feature being released in version one, it is something that's really had a lot of work done within the community. And likely this is going to ship in later versions. One of the key designers involved in this is Tim. He has worked on iteration after iteration, really responding to the feedback. And often, as an example here, just a sketch gets the idea across. And I really like to encourage you this idea of sharing early and sharing often, because it's something within Gutenberg has really fostered and created the project. These are really pretty low fidelity designs, but after going back and forth in these, the ideas have formed. Eventually, things can then move into a prototype. So, I've shared how things have happened in Gutenberg and some of the foundations, but I'd like to take a little moment to start thinking about why design is really important in open source and why creating an open source is important. I'm going to pan out a little bit, and then I'm going to dive back into some lessons that I've learned through Gutenberg. Open source quite simply needs designers. And this isn't me saying it because I'm a designer. It truly needs design to be at the heart. Design, when I say this, isn't just tied to one role either. This goes beyond something really making something look good. And good design and a healthy design community is at the heart of successful projects. And all those roles combine to make a powerful force. They complete the universe. And there are a lot of problems when design is missing in a project. There's a lack of user voice. And trust is often broken in a project that doesn't put care, respect, and thought at the heart. You can pretty often tell a project that has design at the final point of sign off that has designers just coloring or choosing a font. And designers aren't actually a color palette or really a checkbox. This focusing on design can benefit in a, a, a project in a number of different ways. And I've kind of alluded to the understanding and empathy. But these are the tools of designers. And they can bring those to the community. Practicing design also allows you to pan out and see a project, designing the whole community itself. It's often really easy to get obsessed about roles. And even in this talk, I said the word designers a lot. Open source often attracts hybrids. And this is something we really, really should embrace. You could say that WordPress itself is built on hybrids. And, but we often actually expect different levels of technical ability, sometimes wrongly from our designers. Being open to blurring and there's hybrids is being open to everyone. Yes, most are going to identify as one role or the other, but as a project, 
We have to level up design across every single role. We have to be careful of really dismissing opinion, but respectful of those that have made it their life, work, and craft. But there's a problem. Being a designer in open source, if we're really honest, isn't easy. And beyond design, creating an open source today also isn't the easiest thing. Those tirelessly working can feel themselves drained, reduced to pixel pushes and polishes. And the design voice is often, unless space is given, quieter, and often an open source project is far from quiet. One of the ways we can solve this is through design infusion. That's making everyone in the project aware and activated on design. I'm not saying that you need to remove the role of design at all. It's about really using that valuable resource and getting everybody infused with that design because a community that has that runs deeper. It's empathic and it has experience at its core. The voice of the users are gonna shout from every single corner. A good community for design is actually just a good community. And what do I mean? Because that's a pretty broad statement. Well, often the way things like this mean that when you create a good community like this for designers, everybody will also thrive. A community needs to have, give space for voices. And how do we actually do this? I'm gonna share some points that I think would be really good. Researching suggestions is a big one. So before you suggest something on an issue or on a ticket, really investigate. If you're coming into something midway, really get into kind of the archaeology of that ticket. And this goes even more so the deeper and longer the project has been running for. It's likely that it's come up before. And whilst you absolutely may have the key to unlocking, knowing context also helps so much. And it may also be that you actually have the key for another lock. Another really simple thing to do is visualize everything. Take a screenshot for your pull requests and your issues. Designers are amazing, but we are not mind readers. And beyond this, don't just stick to words to describe something. The reality is that actually every single person can in some way draw. And embrace sketching, no matter what role. I really believe that everybody should be doing that. Get an idea out visually, uh, even if it's just rough shapes or copy and paste it together with neon arrows. It matters so much. All voices need to be heard, and to do this, a culture of feedback needs to be cultivated. Space should be created, and the community really shouldn't be focusing on who is shouting the loudest. Feedback needs to be learned and it's an art form that really should be practiced by everyone in the community. A community's ability to give feedback or not, is kind of an indication of its health. When a healthy feedback culture exists, every single voice flourishes and is heard and respect those through that community. This is probably the hardest thing to do, and really, that I'm gonna share now, and that's make a safe space for ideas to grow, from allowing experimentation through to giving space to just see if an idea has form. This is how boundaries have pushed and really incredible work happens. And don't worry about how fully formed something is either. Allow people to share early, share often, and really don't judge that work. If you have that culture of feedback I mentioned earlier, those ideas are just going to shoot and thrive. So this one really isn't easy to do as a discipline, but don't discuss away from where the action is happening too much. Don't use Twitter or Facebook to steer or guide an idea. Sure, throw ideas out and iterate if that's your platform of choice, but bring it back to where the work is going on. If someone has to follow too many platforms to get feedback, their work is gonna suffer. And even worse, that feedback, which is potentially amazing, is gonna be missed. The best solution may just simply never have been heard, and that would really be an incredible shame for the project. 
this has been a little bit of one of the issues with Gutenberg, and one I would say we all have to work to get better at doing. So designers, and in fact any role, need to be onboarded into a project. You can't just land someone into a vast universe of an open source project and expect them to survive. Onboarding should also adapt and be iterated. Contribution needs to be seen as a product, and with that, as a community, we can start really thinking about how to fix and create the best product we can. A mentoring, I would add, is really crucial for any type of contributor. And this goes beyond that onboarding or that initial stage, and can answer a lot of the time zone and diversity issues that face when someone's new to the project. It's also a two-way project. Uh, per, uh, experience. I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of being a mentor, but you learn so much. This one is hard, uh, something we actually do right now. We have a design team, and that is in many respects isolated from other roles. But as has been seen for other projects, design needs to be truly in all areas and infused across the project. Creating safe paths, and bridges and empowering designers to go off and choose their own adventure across the entire project, that's when success happens. This one sounds a little bit obvious. We want to care for everyone, right? We have to, though, recognize that different types of people, those that focus on roles, for example, may need a different type of space. Ultimately, any space that is caring will be better for everyone. And this really gives the space for everyone to be heard and speak up. So the problem with most projects is they attract the same people. And this can also go beyond countries to accessibility and diversity. Even a project that attracts designers doesn't mean that that gets sorted at all. Uh, it potentially just attracting the same type of designers. That's still not good. This is a challenge, but it's one incredibly worthwhile pursuing. By having a wider variety of different designers, you're gonna end up with a rich, deep pool to create from, and that can only be a good thing. So that was quite a panned outlook, and I'm gonna go back and have a look at what I've learned from doing Gutenberg, and um, from creating in that space. Design-infused developers, I really think, are the future. Designers are often in projects a scarcer commodity. And that becomes a problem when we force them to do everything all the time, over and over. By infusing developers with design, some of the burden gets spread. Developers also become empowered. They're not just waiting for a designer to do a bit of work. Conversations happen. Ideas generate, and an incredible workflow occurs across both worlds. This truly is where the exciting things happen in a community. A good first pass can be made in patches once the developer activates with design, and then the designer can be engaged. This saves time, and then issues can be iterated by expressing in design, and that includes that conversation. Feedback processing needs to be done by anyone in the project. We really need to find a way forward, as I mentioned earlier, for these disparate sources and really look at how we can tie all that feedback and get it to the right places. I don't have a solution, but it's something that I think needs flagging and it's something that we really should work together to make sure that we're getting the right feedback in the right places. And similarly to design infusion, Working in cross-discipline teams uh, is priceless, it really is. What you maybe haven't seen so much in Gutenberg is the cross-discipline interactions. The way developers have influenced design and the way designers have embraced development. I kind of have used the term UX developer because I firmly believe that exists in WordPress and it's something we should be embracing. This is a hard one for me because it's been a big lesson. As a design lead of Gutenberg, knowing when to make a decision or when not to make a decision is something that I've learned. Yes, at all times you need to listen and be open to changing over a set direction in your mind, but you also need to make decisions. 
as a project, we have this amazing future of iteration that's out there. But we sometimes forget that we have that possibility to do that. Just because something goes one way, we aren't actually casting it in stone. Similarly, those we let lead, we need to enable those to make the decision and enable more people to lead and make those decisions. It's actually a personal challenge for me because making a decision is something I find really hard. I shy away from it. But it's something we all need to embrace. So we expect designers to do a lot of roles when we have a very scarce commodity. And this goes the same for anyone that leads in our project right now. Just like designers, they are scarce. And this is wrong. We need to make space for more people to lead. And we need to create a community and tools where everybody can thrive. And if a designer thrives, remember, a good community for design is a good community for everyone. I know, because I think like anyone that contributes, you get, feel the pressure to do everything. And we have to change that, because we can't just teleport a lot of people of a particular role into the project. We really have to use the people that we have in the most effective way so that they don't burn up and that they can be there for the long term. As a project, we also really need recognition. A lot of the work that people do is invisible, and that needs to change. We need to make visible what a lot of that work is done and recognize it. Tools are really, really important. Our tools we use in GitHub are slightly better than track, but they don't actually recognize designers or all the way that work actually happens now. They're fragmented. We use many, many different tools to make up one flow. We have to sign into different accounts. I know how to use everything. It's just too much. And whilst we can't wave a magic wand and make our tooling different today, we have to really invest in that as a project. This is from GitLab, and this is just the start. It actually recognizes design contribution or contributions that aren't code by having comments recognized. And GitHub actually has some really bad features. There's a negative emoji reaction where someone cannot comment and just do a thumbs down. That's not necessarily something that moves anything along for people, and it can be used to suppress voices. These tools that we have can be an instrument for building a, a better future, and we need to do that. As a project, we need to focus on creating workflows that nurture and allow many in that world to thrive. One of the things I'm sure we need sooner or later, I would say sooner, is a design system. This has been said a lot of times in the WordPress project. We can't go on as a project without that source of truth. We need to audit what we have at the code and design level, and then look at solving the problem once and for all with having a design system for WordPress. Patterns are the key here, and Gutenberg has unlocked some of that potential with components. We need to turn that key and really walk through that door. Along with this, let's not be afraid of setting guidelines. A more consistent, expected experience across WordPress is actually good for the entire project. A design system also uses the scarce resource we have as designers with respect. They don't have to reinvent everything. Everyone actually gains, and iteration can happen on the components themselves. I've covered a lot in this talk, and I've shown how Gutenberg has been designed and also panned out to see how design needs and could work in open source. I shared some thoughts I have based on the work that I've done within Gutenberg, and how hopefully we can change the future of WordPress to welcome everybody. Design has mattered in Gutenberg, and it matters in WordPress, and we need to create a space where it can thrive. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, um, we got few, I think we've got quite a few minutes uh, for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, please put your hand up. All my slides are available there as well. Uh, um, the URL of the slides at the bottom there. Um, 
Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. 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 あのお客さんのクライアントワークの仕事でもデザインを決めるのはすごく大変なのにそのオープンソースでデザインを決めるというのはいろんな人がいろんな意見を言うと思いますのでそれをこう集約してデザインに落とし込む時それを決定する時はどういうタイミングでというふうに考えてるのかあのそこのポイントをお聞きしたいです。Um, I'll try and summarize that. <laughs>、um, uh, what, how do you incorporate, at what time do you incorporate、uh, feedback and different opinions into design? I really hope I got that. <laughs>、um, all time. It should never be something that just happens at one point, but it shouldn't be something that happens loudly all the time.、Uh, my best advice would be. At the beginning of a project, that noise should be very vocal and, and louder. And as work is happening in a sprint format, the noise should dial down, still keeping that stream of feedback going, and then checking in at various points. So, building into your process the space for feedback and the space for that, that, that opinions from everybody is really important. If you don't build that in, people will just throw opinions at you. So, it's just a way of doing that. I would also say that there needs to be that constant stream going at all times as well. It's just how dialed in you are to that. Thanks, Terry.、Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, more of a philosophical question.、Um, I've always identified WordPress as being WP admin. That's kind of、mm. the product.、Uh, now, with Gutenberg inside、uh, WP admin and a lot of the gravity shifting towards Gutenberg itself,、um, I, I, especially in client meetings, I feel like Gutenberg is WordPress in a way.、Mm. You know, just from、um, how you kind of pitch it and present it. Um, at what point are we losing the name and kind of making it the face of the product and bundling it all together in one nice little thing?、Uh, do you mean losing the name of Gutenberg? Yeah, I mean、uh, okay. losing it completely because I, I, cause right now I, I feel a bit of a disconnect in client meetings still where I'm, where I'm saying there's Gutenberg and there's WordPress and,、uh, and that's okay because we're still in beta, I guess, but we, we kind of have to move away and I, and I feel like Gutenberg will just be called WordPress. So, yeah, I have no facts, but、yeah. my feelings, and this is only looking for your feelings. Yeah, <laughs> this is a personal. I think it is. It's, it's just WordPress.、Um, I think, like any other project, it's kind of okay to have a project name,、uh, but it should just be seen as a project name. We, I, I think the passion in a good way that that, that project name is given, you know,、um, from the logo through, I think that's something we could, should explore later on when we do. I really hope this isn't the only thing we do like Gutenberg. I hope there are more things like that. That's, how we, that's why I'm saying this is the start, not the end.、Um, but for me personally, I think it is WordPress when I'm talking about it. <laughs> Thank you very much for this amazing talk. It was very cool.、Um, Uh, you just talked about design system for WordPress, and it's really uh, uh, such an amazing idea. And I was wondering,、um, how, do you have any ideas how you de,、um, develop or start? Or is there a roadmap to、uh, develop like, a design system in, in,、yeah, in open source?、Um, yeah. yeah, so I have no roadmap. That's me just. Thinking and, and speaking.、Um, I have no roadmap. I would say we potentially, as a community, are already on the roadmap, and that started by having in Gutenberg the components.、Uh, the next step I, I really strongly feel we need to do is auditing. You can't have a design system when you don't know 
what is in your house. And at the moment, we're really not sure what is hiding in different corners of our house. Um, and uh, there's, there's famous tickets of multiple shades of various colors and different things like that because we don't have that consistency yet. There are areas, we've, we've come a long way, but there are areas that we haven't audited. And by doing that, we are taking a strong step forward because you can't build a system around anything that doesn't have that. Um, so that, that would be my, my suggestion uh, of the, the first bit. And that is something that is relatively easy to say, but quite a thing to do, do an audit. But it's just something I think that really should be done. Thank you. Yeah.素敵なお話をありがとうございました。この私はこのグーテンベルグのグーテンベルグのデザインのコンポーネントやデザインシステムにとても興味があります。で、そのデザインのシステムのドキュメントですとかもしくはデザインのデータスケッチのデータですとか
Um, as a designer, what is your motivation to be keep people for this long? As you mentioned about design system, if you want to work on that kind of stuff, you might want to move uh, work on some other project, or you know, there's like other services out there. That, but what is your motivation to, as a designer to be keep working with this WordPress project? So I have a few motivations. I think uh, one I feel strongly at the moment is making open source work for designers. That feels like a, a strong motivation for me. Um, and that's not saying like it's, it's a horrible place at all. I think that both designers don't get seen in open source as much. Um, and also design doesn't attract, uh, open source doesn't attract designers as much. I really, uh, my motivation is I just like iterating and making things better on this scale and that's something in design, if you work for a big company, yes you do, but this is incredible. I have open source running as well as design running inside me, like in my veins, so it's like both of my happy things to do that. Um, the chance that your design makes a difference from open source. You could be working on a project as a designer and your product makes money, but it doesn't necessarily make the difference that WordPress can make. That's a huge thing. And enabling people to contribute as designers really is a huge motivation for me. There's a lot of motivations I have. Um, and nothing is ever the same when you work in an open source project as a designer. It's always different and because we need have that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, we're going to finish this uh, session. Um, Tommy is going to be in the room. Oh, room I, the Wapu Cafe, after this for a bit. So if you hear anyone want to chat with her, ask about anything about Gutenberg, you can find her questions. Um, if you're not, um, and she'll be here for the rest of the day. So can catch her there too. Um, so, and if you uh, are unsure about English, please grab a staff from somewhere and I'm sure they'll just translate into Japanese English. So, um, please give her a big applause once more. Thank you so much.